Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. And today, we're going to be talking science and faith, as I am joined by author and research scholar of Reasons to Believe, Jeff Zwering. Jeff's ability to embrace the what-if questions has earn respect from religious and non-religious people. So we're going to be talking to him about his research and faith and anything else Jeff wants to talk about. So Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today. Curtis, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Looking forward to our time to talk today. Oh, I appreciate you. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? So as you mentioned, my name is Jeff Zwerink. I am an astrophysicist, and I chose that profession because from the earliest moments of my childhood, I just remember being fascinated with science. Uh, One of my earliest memories was watching my dad do a chemistry demonstration for a group that my older brother was involved with, you know, dip balls in liquid nitrogen, throw them on the wall, they shatter, mix chemicals together, make cool noises, cool smells cool shapes, all sorts of stuff. Just fascinated with the way things work. I wanted to be a chemist until I took physics my senior year of high school. And for as much as I love chemistry, I love physics. So I went into physics in college, um, have uh, been a Christian most of my life. My parents became Christians when I was three years old. They just inculcated and taught us, taught my brothers and I what Christianity meant. I embraced the Christian faith. Uh, in fifth grade, grew in my faith in fits and spurts over time. But as I was in college, uh, there was this idea that science and faith were in conflict or science and Christianity were in conflict with one another. And what I recognized through some speakers and some research on my own is that now they really do belong together. They go together. And so uh, the intersection of science and Christianity seemed to happen a little more in astrophysics. So I switched to be uh, not just a plane physicist, but an astrophysicist and have been doing that for the last 25 ish years or so. So that's kind of where I am. And I I work at an organization called Reasons to Believe. I also work uh, part time as a project scientist over at UCLA working on an experiment Hopefully, it will tell us what in the world dark matter is. So, how do you feel? How do you feel like you are able to maintain your belief in the Bible, but but still study science the way that you do? You know, a lot of people think that there's a conflict between those two things, and I think a lot of that, at least today, is attributed to this notion that when. Uh, you're talking about science, that's where you're talking about facts and logic and reason. And when you're talking about religion, you're talking about belief and hope and, and feelings. And what I found is that is not an accurate description of how I approach my Christianity or my science. What I have found is that the Bible is God's revelation to us of himself, and we want to study that, and we investigate it, we read it, we want to know there are certain passages that seems like this one says one thing and this one says another thing, and so we do a lot of work to figure out what is it actually saying, what is it declaring to be truth, and then as a Christian, uh, I have to decide whether that's a good source of information and put my trust in that. Well, when I look at what I'm doing in the science, I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm going out uh, measuring how things behave, trying to take data to see whether this way of looking at it's right or that way. I'm testing it. And once I find out, hey, this is the truth, then I'm choosing to put my faith in that truth. And so I find science and Christianity are really doing the same thing when they're done properly. And so I know a lot of people see tension between them. As I've looked at them, I find that my studies in science affirm the truth of what I found in Christianity. And as I grow stronger in my Christian understanding and beliefs and and conviction of who God is, that drives me to be a better scientist. I find that they work very well together. In fact, I found that they belong together. What do you feel like there's another universe out there? And if, if so, what will we need to do to detect that 
the universe? Well, I certainly feel like it's possible that there could be. Uh, maybe that uh, all we see is all there is. And one of the challenges of answering that question is you got to define what a universe is. Uh, I kind of go with the approach that the universe is everything that we could possibly see. And so in some sense, you know, you go back early 1900s when people started building telescopes or you know, using telescopes to look out in the heavens. They found these blobs of light and they were observing them. They called them island universes. Uh, we now call them galaxies. So uh, some of that depends on how you define it. But when we look at all that we see in creation or in this cosmos, uh, it's pretty big. And I think it is entirely possible that God might have created other universes. I mean, we see that when we read through the Bible. Interestingly, a lot of people think there's other universes now based on the scientific evidence. So I think it's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer, but I would, if I were a betting man, I think, yeah, there are probably other universes out there. Well, let's talk about the multiverse. Explain what the multiverse is and what you expect us to detect in the next decade regarding the multiverse. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, to define a multiverse, which in these many verses, you got to figure out what a one a universe is. And one of the at least definitive ways, you know, understandable ways of defining it is saying, all right, what is the most distant place where light, some that information from that place could get to Earth? Well, we know that inside this universe, light travels no fat or the, the fastest anything can travel is the speed of light. And that's 186,000 miles per second. And so if you, uh, you know, that means that when we're looking at the moon about 200,000 miles away, we see it as it was one second ago, not as it is right now. When we go out to the sun, it's about eight, eight and a half minutes ago. In fact, that means that if the sun were to go out right now, we would not know it for eight to eight and a half minutes. But as you go further and further out, it takes light longer and longer to get to us. And so we can actually, because the universe has a, a time or an age of 14 billion years and the speed of light is a finite value, we can actually determine that the amount of stuff that we will ever see is a this very large bubble of stuff that's probably about 50 billion light years away from us right now. So if we define that as the universe, the multiverse is just anything beyond that. Now, it could be a whole lot more of the same stuff. It could be other regions of space where the laws of physics might look very different. It could be things where mathematics behaves very differently. There's different ways of looking at it, but really the multiverse is just anything beyond what we define as the universe. And, and I think there's good reason to think there may be a multiverse out there. Well, let's talk about, explain the difference between dark energy and dark matter. And also, if you can share some light on the research you're doing about dark matter, do, do so if you can. I know some of that stuff might be kind of hush-hush. <laughs> uh, at least what I'm working on is not hush-hush. So I will touch on that because I find dark matter pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, to understand the difference between dark matter and dark energy, we need to understand some of the research that people have done. So there's this very cool phenomenon in the way the universe works that it's very difficult to weigh the earth. I mean, there's no uh, scale you could put it on, nothing big enough to do that. But the way Newtonian, what Isaac Newton discovered, and this is true in general relativity as well uh, with Einstein, is that if you look at how something orbits around a body, so the fact that the moon goes around the earth, we can look at the moon's orbit and how it behaves, and that will tell us how much mass the earth has. Similarly, if you take the earth, you want to, want to figure out how much mass the sun has, you look at the objects that go around it. So we can do that with Mercury and Venus and Mars and Earth and Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Uh, you can do it with Pluto too, even though it's not really a planet these days. But by doing that, you can figure out how much mass, or looking at the orbits, you can figure out how much mass the sun has. So astronomers took that concept and looked out at galaxies, and what they did was measured the orbits of stars that were orbiting around the galaxy. 
And that or those orbits will tell them how much mass is inside that orbit. Well, they can also go count up all the stars inside there. And we know how to, given, the, given a kind of star, we can tell how much mass it is. So we can count up how much mass is in the stars. And it turns out that the amount of mass that we calculate being there from the orbits is more than the amount of mass given by the stars that are there. And so astronomers, being very creative in their naming conventions, said there's this mass out there that doesn't give off any light. Let's call it dark matter. Now, we have evidence of dark matter in our galaxy and other galaxies. We can do the same types of calculations with clusters of galaxies and super clusters of galaxies. And we see this evidence for dark matter on all sorts of scales. And so dark matter is really just mass that we know is there, but it doesn't give off any light. So it's really hard to detect. And when I talk about light, it's any kind of light. It's no radio waves, no x-rays, no microwaves, no infrared, visible, ultraviolet. None of those does it give off. It's dark. And that tells us something about the kind of matter it is. And I'll, I'll get back to that in just a second when I talk about my research. So that's what dark matter. Now you ask the question, what's the difference between that and dark energy? Well, back in the early 1900s, uh, Einstein proposed his theory of general relativity and that the, the generic solutions that say the universe is either expanding or contracting. Well, as people were using their telescopes to look at these distant galaxies, what they found was that the farther away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us. Now, that's the telltale signature of an expanding universe. And so for the last 100 years, 100 plus years now, astronomers have been going out and saying, all right, what can, where can we find galaxies? How can we tell how far away they are and how fast they're moving? Let's, ex let's map out how fast the universe has been expanding, because we can use that then to tell us how old the universe is. And so astronomers have been doing these calculations for many, many decades. Well, about 25, 30 years ago, as they were using a particular type of star that explodes with a known type of brightness or a consistent type of brightness, they were making measurements way out in the universe. And what they found was that... Uh, you know, the, the universe is expanding and because it's got a bunch of mass, the mass is going to gravitationally pull on everything and that's going to slow the expansion down. What they found is that the further away they looked, the universe was actually starting to accelerate. The expansion was getting faster. And so there's this some kind of energy out there is causing the universe to expand. And again, astronomers being real creative, since we've got mass that we can't see, we call it dark. We've got this energy that's causing the universe to expand and we can't see what it is. We'll call it dark energy. And so dark matter is this kind of mass that governs the dynamics of the universe and how it behaves. Dark energy is a particular type of energy that we're still trying to figure out what in the world it is that governs how the fabric of space expands uh, th th that we see in our universe. And so it's pretty fascinating. These are you know, we found out about dark energy maybe 25 years ago. We've known about dark matter for maybe 80 years ago. But outside of the fact that we know they exist, it's really difficult to figure out what in the world they are. Well, let's talk about artificial intelligence. As you know, there's a lot of AI out there and it's becoming more popular for more things. But give us your opinion on it. Do you feel like it's good or bad for humanity? Do you feel like it'll save us or, or make humans obsolete once it really starts to take form? That's a really good question. And I've got to say, as I've done research on this, I find people have opinions that are across the spectrum. Some say that AI is going to be the greatest thing that humanity's ever done. Others will say it's going to destroy humanity. I, I think the reality of it is it's somewhere in the middle of that. And I'm less concerned about the technology itself and far more concerned about how humans are gonna use the technology. For example, if I said, hey, there's a hundred million dollars, do you say a hundred million dollars is good or bad? No, I mean, it's a hundred million dollars. It's, it's just a tool, if you will. Now, we can use that tool well to do good for people, to help people out, 
or we can use that tool to cause damage and harm. In fact, one of the things that you find is that a lot of lottery winners, uh, you know, we're kind of getting a, a better handle on how to help people win a lottery and not have it do this. But a lot of times lottery winners, they're given a lot of money. So they're given this very powerful tool. And if they're not well equipped to use it, they end up causing a lot of damage and destruction. Uh, you know, one, one that I, one story that I found particularly interesting that illustrates this point is a fellow named Jack Whitaker. You know, he was a multimillionaire, had a seventeen million dollar business, won a hundred million dollar jackpot. You know, it was actually a two hundred million dollar jackpot, but he got about a hundred million of it. So here he is, got about $130 million, you know, says that he wants to give it to charities, give to churches, help people with it. You know, he bought a house for the person at the diner that sold him the ticket, wanted to do good things for his daughter and for her, his granddaughter. And what's interesting is that while Jack Whitaker, while this fellow did pretty well in terms of his life, within a couple of years after winning his daughter was dead, his daughter, granddaughter was dead, and her his boy, her boyfriend were dead. I mean, there's a lot of damage that came because this tool was not used well. When I think about AI, that's the question I have. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at artificial intelligence trying to build into computers the capacity to learn and grow and know. And ultimately, the goal, I think, one of the goals, one of the long-term goals is, can we build something that is sentient like humanity. Now, I'm kind of pessimistic that we'll ever be able to do that because what you're doing when you build into a computer is you're putting into this hardware some software, which is an algorithm. It can be a very sophisticated, very complex, very uh, elegant algorithm, but nonetheless, it's just an algorithm. And when we look at humanity, what we find is that everything, while well, everything I do has an algorithm. So, you know, when I'm getting ready for the show here, you know, there's this process I go through. I set up the technology. I get the lighting. Think about what I'm going to say. There, there's an algorithm to everything I do. But nothing I do is just an algorithm. Uh, you know, when the place I was going to film today didn't work, I could go in problem solving mode and think, hey, what could do this? What could I need to find a place that'll do this, that and the other thing. And so I go set my stuff up and find all of that that I need. There's not an algorithm to that. There's a creative process. There's a moral pro moral component to it. As humans, we are not just physical beings. And so if we're trying to replicate sentience in a purely physical thing like a computer, then I don't think we're going to do it. Now, that being said, AI fills the landscape of how we operate today. When you talk to the maps in your computer and say, hey, I want to go somewhere, there's an AI that is gather, or, you know, looking at the available data and saying, here's the best route to go. It, it's not just some pre-programmed, hey, when these conditions are met, do this. It's actually taking into account the real-time conditions and calculating a solution, if you will. Um, when you talk to your phone and say, hey, what? ask it a question. We ask Siri, that's an AI. We've got AIs that can play chess better than the best humans. We've got AIs that can play poker better than the best human players. We've got AIs that can do medical diagnoses better than doctors. We've got, or you know, looking at x-rays and MRIs and scans and, and looking for tumors and stuff, AIs that are better than that. We've got AIs that can do facial recognition and AIs that can read and produce music and write books. And so we've got AIs that do all of these things that humans can do. What I'm actually concerned about is not that we'll continue to develop AIs, but that we will attribute human consciousness to these AIs because they so readily mimic the behavior or, or mimic the, the ways that humans interact with, or, with one another and with uh, the world in which we live. And so I think humans will seed may seed control to the AIs because they can do things better than us. We may... Uh, choose to have relationships with AIs, which are not really alive in that sense, instead of human relationships. And we're designed, I mean, all the research shows that we are designed to interact with other humans. So I think AIs 
AI has a lot of potential to benefit humanity. But to me, the big question is, what worldview do we want to operate under? Because there's a lot of things we take for granted as being humans, that, that all people are valuable, that we want to take care of the innocent, that we want to take care of the poor and the weak, that we want to take care of this creation. We want to benefit humanity. Yes, the question, which worldviews actually provide the basis or the foundation to do that? And I would argue that the Judeo-Christian worldview is the worldview that allows that to happen reliably. And so I'm less concerned about the development of AI and far more concerned about how we as people will use AI. I have the suspicion that we may not be mature enough and we may not have the right worldview that allows us to use AI to benefit humanity, and we're actually going to end up causing a lot of damage and harm. Absolutely. So let's talk about Elon Musk. In 2024, he's planning on sending a SpaceX crew to try to colonize Mars. Do you think he'll be successful? I think he's probably going to make pretty good strides. Uh, what we know in studying Mars is that it is a very inhospitable environment. Uh, you know, people here on Earth will climb Mount Everest and you actually get above a certain level and your body starts dying because there's not enough oxygen in the atmosphere up there. Well, when you go out to Mars, Mars atmosphere is 50 times less dense than the top of Mount Everest, and it has no oxygen in it. So just from an atmospheric perspective, Mars is a very inhospitable environment. Because it doesn't have much of an atmosphere, lots of cosmic rays make it down to the surface of the planet. So you're exposed to a lot of radiation, not just being on the planet. So in principle, you could dig, dig, you know, maybe five, 10 feet underground, build your homes down in there and shield yourself from the cosmic radiation. But the traveling to and from, you're exposed to a substantial fraction of a lethal dose. I mean, if a lethal dose is one, you're, you're exposed to about 20% of that. Um, just on traveling to and from Mars. So being out in space for that long is a pretty hostile thing. Uh, you know, again, just research that we've done on astronauts and other things show, or and other for ventures out into space show that long-term out in space, and we're talking long-term as, you know, six months to maybe 18 months, which is kind of minimum of what it takes to be able to get to and around Mars and back. Uh, people have their bone density goes down. They have uh, problems in their digestive lining so that they can't eat and digest food well. They often have problems, neurological problems that cause them to not think well. Their spinal, you know, their, their nervous system problems that arise. Being out in space is a pretty hostile environment. And so the question is, can we travel through space in a safe and reliable way, get to Mars, and then build a colony that is going to sustain itself. I think we will probably be able to do that for a while. I don't know that we're going to be able to do it long term, because if we're going to do it long term, we got to figure out how do you build an environment on Mars that is subject to all of these dangerous situations where any one of them is catastrophic, uh, whereas here on Earth, there's not many places you could go on the surface of the Earth where you're going to have catastrophic damage. You know, imagine trying to build a colonizable environment under the ocean. You know, the dome cracks a little bit and the water starts leaking in and everybody dies. Well, there's multiple scenarios like that that would play out on Mars from radiation environments, from atmosphere environments to lack of oxygen. Finding water is going to be really hard. Uh, and if any of your equipment quits working, then there's no, oh, we'll just move somewhere else. There's there's just not, there's no margin for, very little margin for error there. And so I think we will be able to put people on Mars. People will travel to Mars. They will survive for a while, maybe for quite some time, be able to come back. We may be able to even put a small group of people on Mars. 
but colonizing in large scale where, you know, like the total recall where people are living there and there's hundreds, if not thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of people. I don't think anything like that's going to happen, at least not in my lifetime, just because Mars is incredibly hostile to life in contrast to Earth, which is just built for life to exist. I mean, every place where you can think of life existing on Earth it exists. And even many places that we thought life couldn't exist, we find that life exists on Earth. So Earth seems to have this built-in design capacity to support life. Mars is a very hostile environment for life. So I think it's a fun fun endeavor. Will it work? I don't know. I'm kind of anxious or excited and uh, interested to see how it plays out as we pursue that very challenging endeavor. This might seem like a wild question, but how common do you think asteroid strikes are on the Earth? Depends on the size of the asteroid. I mean, a few years ago, we had a meteor come streaking through uh, Russia over in Chelyabinsk and, uh, you know, had a big fireball up in the sky. And stuff like that happens every 10 to 50 years, uh, given the size. That was probably 10 meters, maybe 15 meters in diameter. Um you get up larger than that, something maybe 100 meters. Well, something like that happens maybe every 5,000 years. Uh, that's going to make it down to the Earth, hit and make an a-, a pretty good crater on the Earth, something like that. Uh, you know, there's, there's a crater over in Arizona where an asteroid hit that was larger than that. You get up to something that's maybe a kilometer in size, 1,000 meters across. That's about three football fields. Now that's going to happen maybe every 500,000 years. So... Uh, you know, humanity's been on Earth probably, let's say, 200,000 years. Uh, we may have had one of those in the, in the history of humanity, whereas there's going to be 100-meter objects. Those have been multiple ones of those will have hit the Earth already, uh, hundreds if not thousands of those. And ever, we also know that asteroids can be much, much larger than that. There was something that was probably 10 kilometers or 10,000 meters across that struck the Yucatan Peninsula back about 66 million years ago, and that wiped out the dinosaurs and most of the life on Earth. So asteroid strikes are actually really common, but most of those are really small, and we don't even know about them. Hard to detect. You know, you go out watching the sky, and you see these little things streaking across. We call them shooting stars. Those are, in some sense, little asteroids that are hitting the Earth. Those happen all the time. The bigger you get, the more infrequent they get. Uh, you know, and you get up to something that's like 10,000, or sorry, roughly, you know, on the order of 10 miles across, something like that hits about every 50 to 100 million years. Well, the last one of those was about 66 million years ago. So we're either 16 million years overdue or somewhere in the next 34 million years, it's going to happen again. So these things happen all the time. It's just a matter of how big and how destructive. The big destructive ones don't happen very often. And that's good because humanity doesn't respond very well to big destructive things like that. Well, let's talk about your writings. You got some books and some articles out there. So kind of tell listeners where they can check it out and what they can expect when, when they read your work. So I I work, as I mentioned earlier, I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe. And so one of the best places to go find uh, the writings that I do is go to reasons.org. There's a store where you can find my books, um, you know, kind of three books that I would highlight. One is uh, called Who's Afraid of the Multiverse? And this was a book that I wrote because people were talking about the multiverse. And I thought, oh, that's a threat to the Christian faith. And lo and behold, as I dug into it, what I recognized is that The multiverse isn't a threat to the Christian faith. In fact, the Bible describes a multiverse in a number of or in a number of ways. You know, there's this realm, but there's the spiritual realm. That's a different universe, if you will. It's a spiritual, not a physical universe. But there's going to be a new heaven and new earth. And so the Bible talks in multiverse terms. It just doesn't use that language. And so as I was exploring, what I found is that actually the multiverse fits far more comfortably within a Christian worldview than it does a naturalistic worldview. And so that's what you're going to find. Who's afraid of the multiverse? Wrote a book, Is There Life Out There? You know, Is there life out in the universe? Again, a question I had, how does Christianity interact with the idea that we might find life out in the universe? Find it a fascinating theological question, great scientific question. Another book I wrote, Escaping the Beginning. 
is there really a beginning to the universe? Because the Bible starts off, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's a pretty foundational idea in scripture. And so you'll notice that a lot of my books are questions. And these are questions that I have that I've wrestled with. And I, here's how I see it being worked out. And in every instance thus far, and I expect the trend to continue, in every instance, I found that science and Christianity really do line up well. You'll also find lots of blog articles, some videos to look at, download. I host a show called 2819, where we talk about important scientific and philosophical discoveries and how they relate to Christianity. But reasons.org has uh, great links to all of those. And if you're interested, you can follow me on social media, you know, Twitter and Facebook, R R RTB underscore Jay Zwering. Uh, send in questions, thoughts, comments, and uh, I can interact with you there if you're so interested. You just answered my next question. So tell us about reasons to believe. And I know that you have the Dark Matter Project coming up. So tell us about reasons to believe and about any other upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to be on the lookout for. Well, I, you know, my Dark Matter Project, I'm actually working on an experiment over at UCLA where we 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 can find evidence that dark matter exists in our universe, but we don't know what it is. We just see its gravitational effects. We think it's a particle. That's the most likely explanation. And we've got a number of scientific reasons why the particle might be this or that or the other. And so one of the types of particles that we think it would be has this cool feature that it's its own uh, you know, if you take an electron, that's a particle, and a positron, which is its antiparticle, you put them together, they annihilate, and you get energy. Well, dark matter, if it's its own antiparticle, if it ever collides with itself, it will also give off a bunch of energy, and it gives off enough energy that it can produce a certain type of particle, which there's virtually no other way to make in the universe. We make it in our particle accelerators, but out in the cosmos, they don't happen. So we're building a balloon experiment. It's about three, three and a half meters a cube. That's about three and three, three and a half meters on each side. We're going to float it up on a balloon up to 120,000 feet down in Antarctica and let it float around for 30 or 40 days. And we're looking for this type of particle to pass through our detector. And if we find three, four, five of these of a certain kind of, with certain kinds of characteristics, that'll say, hey, this is the kind of particle dark matter is. And that will allow other scientists to go out and say, all right, let's build experiments that are sensitive to this kind of particle. And it'll give us a great, great deal of insight into how to do that. And I mean, if we actually find these particles, there's a pretty good chance that the uh, leader of our project may get the Nobel Prize. That's That's the level of discovery it would be. So I've been working on that over at UCLA. We're supposed to launch that in 2023. It's called GAPS. Uh, it's, the acronym stands for General Antiparticle Spectrometer because we're looking for an antiparticle that's a, a an antiproton and an antineutron put together. And if one of those passes through our detector with a certain energy, you know, like I said, a handful of those will tell us what dark matter is. So that's uh, I, I like that because it you know it keeps me connected into the scientific research and I get to write computer programs. That's kind of why I'm interested in artificial intelligence. I get to uh, study about dark matter, lots of cool things. It's just a fascinating project. I, I work for uh, my full time job is uh, working for Reasons to Believe, which is a science faith organization, an organization that is uh, that believes that science and Christianity really work well together, that what we find Christ where Christianity talks about how the world works, that we're going to find that science is going to affirm and validate that that's what's correct, and that our scientific discoveries will show the Christianity uh, that they both work well together, because ultimately they are both God's revelation to us. God's revealed himself in scripture, God's revealed himself in creation, and as we properly study those, they're going to say the same thing. And thus far in all my studies, I've found that they agree very well, Lots of cool problems and cool things that is like, well, I don't know what that, I don't know how to explain that yet. Lots of interesting things to study, but where we've got definitive data, they really do line up well. And so we just want to use that to tell people about Christianity because, uh, you know, the, the, the message of Christianity is that God desires a relationship with us and he has created this world and has built us for a relationship with him. We've rebelled against him and didn't want that. And so he sent his son, Jesus, to atone for our 
transgressions and rebellion against him and invites us into a relationship with him. And so we want to use science to help people see that what Christianity has to say is true and to, the, to come to join and to have that relationship with God uh, that he's provided a way through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. That's what we're about and that's what we want to do. So, Oh, definitely. Close us out with any final thoughts. Maybe it's something that we didn't talk about that you would like to touch on or just any final thoughts you got for the listeners. We could have ended it right there as good as you put that, but give us some final thoughts. I have found in, as I've lived that there are great tools that are before us that help us discern the truth. I think science is a great tool for figuring out the mechanisms and how the world works. And I love learning about bizarre things, fascinating things, and figuring out how the laws of physics, how they help us understand how it works and why it works that way. We also found that while science is a great tool for giving us truth, it's kind of inadequate for explaining the, the important things of life. Why do we exist? Why do we care about others? Should we care about others? What's good? What's right? What's wrong? And that's where I find Christianity gives a great a, a, a comprehensive view of how this world is, tells us who we are, who God is, how we relate to him. And it gives us great hope for, in spite of all the things that may be going on in the world that seem hard or dangerous or wrong or unjust, that we know that at the end of the day, God is in control. He's a just God. He's a loving God. He's a caring God. He's a good God. And growing in our relationship with him is what we're designed to do. And all of the, the things that we see are wrong are going to be set right. And we just have the, the glory and the splendor and majesty that God has waiting for us uh, in heaven when this world is done and, and we get to go to heaven is beyond imagination and compare. And so I just want people to know that. Hope, hope uh, what I've said and found encouraging maybe cause you to think a little bit. Uh, but I want you to know just how much God loves you and wants and and what he's done so that you can have a relationship with him. Absolutely. We want you to know that listeners. And we also want you to go to reasons.org, check out Jeff's organization and everything that they're up to and wish Jeff and his crew the best of luck on their dark matter research. Also want you to follow rate review, share this episode to as many people as possible who are interested in learning about science and faith. Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. I've really enjoyed our conversation and time together. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.